right. Welcome to The Boost, conversations with people promoting mental health. And we have an excellent one here today with Patrick Casal. And he's with All Things Private Practice, CEO, founder of that organization. Uh, Patrick, it's great to see you. We've talked a number of times. How are you doing today? It's great to see you too, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me on. I know we recorded in the past and the recording went awry. So happy to do this again. And it's always fun talking with you. Yeah, man, you too. Um, there's a, right, by the way, so give what's me that. that? I said you said my name right too. So excellent. Good. Uh, I slow walked it. I, uh, yeah, we have talked in the past and it's, it's just something in my mind, sometimes names and pronunciations, I don't quite nail. So I'm glad I got it right. I'm, I'm going to try it again later in the show just to make <laughs> sure, but that's just going to be showing off at that point. Sure. Um, sure. Turney is Turney also gets messed up. I think we may be used to be Turner or something. And, uh, and then I was born on Thanksgiving. So a lot of people in like junior high and high school, like made the jump to Turkey, which was a lot of fun for a few minutes. And then, sure. um, yeah. and then I hated it and then I embraced it. <laughs> <laughs> you embrace it, then it can't, it can't get you down anymore. Can't hurt me. Yeah. yeah. It can't hurt me. I just became that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But Casal, I think I got it right from here on out. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk about goals today. Um, there's a there's a line in the movie The Fockers where uh, the dad is talking to this uh, future son-in-law about his rental car, and it was green. And he's like, uh, "Well, they say geniuses pick green." And the son-in-law is like, "Oh, oh yeah." And then the father-in-law is like, "But you didn't pick it." Yeah. And he's like, "Oh yeah, you know, but." Uh, I'm looking at our backdrops and I'm like, man, I think you are something of a genius. If I just had to make a guess. And I think, it, I think there's a lot to be said about people's backgrounds as like speaking for, you know, kind of them in some little way. Um, I'm going to be intentional in 24 about, about leveling up mine, but I dig yours. It's so rich. It's so green. And, and I think it communicates something of, in my experience of talking with you, uh, just kind of the brilliance that you have that comes out just in a natural conversation. So I'm excited to talk with you. Oof, I feel like so much pressure, Steve. I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> I, the I will say it is my favorite color. However, <laughs> I did not pick it. Similar to what you just said from Robert De Niro to Ben Stiller. I came home from a conference in Hawaii and it was right around my birthday. I was so jet lagged. I came upstairs, put my stuff up here, went back downstairs and my wife was like, did you see your office at all? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh, go back upstairs. And she had like painted my entire office this color because it's my favorite color. Then she had an artist friend of hers draw a silhouette, like a massive silhouette from my favorite movie, Lord of the Rings on the wall. Whoa. And like created this Hobbit hole uh, wreath on my door, all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see any of that. I'm so jet lagged. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh man, that's a whole new layer to the story yep. of your background. Yep. Okay, so you didn't pick it. It was your wife, but then you didn't. You didn't also uh, paint over it. And so you. Oh, it, it's, it's my favorite color. So it, it it made sense. It was just like one of those things where you're like, oh, I just shot myself in the foot. Like, <laughs> how was I so oblivious to my surroundings? Yeah, uh, my family celebrates Christmas, and like three years ago, my wife, who has impeccable taste. I have very minimalist tastes. She bought me a pair of like, I don't even know how to describe them, but Air Jordans, like low, low, low cut Air Jordans or something, not the high tops. And uh, I didn't ask for them. And when I played basketball in my younger days, Nikes never fit me. They were too narrow. And so I was like, oh, shoot, these are, I'm going to send these back. And uh, they fit like a glove for whatever reason, this one cut of shoe. And so... I wore them and I didn't realize like how much of a cultural movement wearing these shoes is. And so people all the time com comment about my shoes to the point that every Christmas now I ask for one thing, which is like another pair of Air Jordans. And even last night, this guy was like, oh, man, you've always got these killer shoes on. And man, I love your J's. And I was like, Oh, you call them J's? Like, is that, <laughs> that's what we do? Okay. I'm going to remember that they're called J's and try to use that like a normal person. Um, but yeah, credit my wife for like making me actually stylish. 
<laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, I could, I could say the same thing. If I look at my closet right now, I have far more clothes than I've ever had in my life where I used to wear like all black all the time. And now everything is like fitted and all the things. And I'm like, it's amazing what happens when you have someone in your life who cares so much about you that they just want to see you just improve throughout life constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wear a lot of black. So I think maybe she's like, the one thing I can influence the most is like <laughs> shoes. You certainly can't wear the same shoes every day. Right. Um, but I'm thankful, thankful for her and her influence. What tell us something you're thankful for It's something we do every show, which is the virtual hug, but tell us something you're grateful for today. Well, right on cue. I think it's just for my wife, Ariel. She's been my biggest support and cheerleader throughout everything. We've been married for almost 10 years and I attribute a lot of the success that I've had to her because like I am someone who questions everything that I do, whether or not it's going to be successful, whether it's going to flop. I most often err on the side of it's going to flop. Um, and she's just the one constant who's always like, no, like we're going to, we're going to work through this because everything you do seems to work out in a way that is really special. And I think you need someone in your corner like that when you're an entrepreneur. Um, because there are so many times where you're just questioning yourself and questioning your abilities and questioning, is this going to work or is this a bad idea or is it better suited for someone else? And just to continue to re have that resilience and resolve to continue to keep going is a, is a major factor in this, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you're somebody who's going from zero to one with a lot of ideas, like you're sort of inventing or creating out of nothing. Um, something net new and valuable. And I would guess that you would bring a lot of rigor and introspection to your ideas and look at them from every angle and probably to the point where, whether it's, uh, you know, on the side of overthinking as some people might call it, or, you know, what have you, you know, to have your, your, your spouse come in and say, oh man, this, this looks like a great one. And, and give you that kind of that pat on the back of confidence to say, look at your history, you know, look at, like past behavior typically is similar to future behavior. So look what you're doing. That's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Well, on the heels of that, give us your shameless plug, which is you're the best person to talk about the work you're doing. And it doesn't have to be braggadocio, but it can be uh, just whatever you want to be when you're telling people about the work you're, you've done and, and that you're doing or, or working on. Love to hear that from you. Trying to get better at this. I always hate talking about myself. And whenever someone reads my bio, I cringe. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I, I own All Things Private Practice, which is a coaching and consulting business for mental health entrepreneurs, specifically neurodivergent entrepreneurs. I'm shifting into that for 2024. So we do coaching for people who want to scale into other ventures other than one-on-one -on -one therapy. I host international retreats and summits all over the world. My 2024 is nuts, Steve. Like... Between January and June, I have an Asheville retreat, a Norway retreat, a Ireland retreat, a Spain retreat, a Greece retreat. So I will not be home much. Um, I am the host of the All Things Private Practice podcast, where we talk about entrepreneurial mindset, especially for mental health professionals. Talk about the struggle areas, the fears, failures, uh, imposter syndrome, self-doubt, interview style. Then I also co-host the Divergent Conversations podcast which has been a huge passion project of mine this year um, with Dr. Megan Neff. We're both autistic ADHD mental health professionals. We talk about personal experience, life experience, and then we zoom out from a clinical perspective to give people actual tangible skills that they can apply. And it's become wildly successful in a matter of four months. We have 200,000 downloads, which is crazy. And um, you can find me at all things private practice on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And if you ever want to travel to any of these destinations, you can, check out my stuff, but they're all sold out. So I don't know how to, that's kind of it. Yeah. You're in your head space is like 2025. Like it's don't you have terrible. like Ireland 2025 or something that you're already thinking about? <laughs> well, I'm not already thinking about it. It's already sold out. It's, uh, <laughs> it's already sold out, man. You got the Midas touch. This is a problem though, because then you have to start thinking about like what's next. And then it sometimes becomes challenging to appreciate what's in front of you because you're constantly thinking about, okay, what's the next offer? Because that's marketing 101, right? Is always have some offer to follow up on. And so for the people who come to the retreats over the next couple of months, what am I going to say? Like, keep an eye out for something else that's coming. I don't know what it is yet, which has basically been my process my entire life. Hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, it is marketing 101. I, I don't always do a great job of it. I'm trying to do a better job of it, actually playing around with the idea of um, some kind of course. And um, something I do really well is LinkedIn, people tell me. And it's like I've been blind to it for years. I started in 2008, I think, on the platform and just given my B2B sort of career and then now with this conference, it's just been a great place for me. But I'm thinking about how to share that out and different events that are coming across the radar. But yeah, you're right. You always have to have that next thing. And for you, it's like you you just pile success on success. So you start going farther out with these time bound offerings like events. And then you also have courses and other ways that people can access you on demand. Yeah. I've, um, I've got to work on building some evergreen content for courses because my voice has been so majorly impacted by the surgery I had last October. So it doesn't allow me to show up and do like live coaching programs anymore, which was a big portion of my business before September, 2022. And after that, I had to, I, kept, I had to completely pivot. And I think that's the testament to any entrepreneur who's successful is pivoting in the face of challenge and adversity because I can't speak for sustained periods of time anymore. So I can't show up live for 90 minute group coaching calls the way I would want to. And mm. it takes away some of that. So, um, but I think going back to your LinkedIn comment, it's a good representation of this mindset of like the things that maybe I, that come easily to me or that I have been successful at. We kind of have this assumption that everyone finds these things easy or natural. When in reality, there are so many people who are like, I don't even know how to use LinkedIn. Like I would be one of those people. I'd be like, Steve, I'd hire you to have to optimize my LinkedIn. I don't do anything with it. So like there's definitely opportunity there for sure. Oh man. Well, that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> you join my course in uh, yeah, April, 2024. I mean, yeah. it may be something like that because yeah, right. I, I also, it's so much easier to see the miracle in other people. Like, uh, I did a post on LinkedIn the other day about this and it's kind of a fun story. And the point was like, one, what are we doing with our time, our limited time to add value to other people's lives and to sort of let these miracles flow through us, you know, quote unquote miracles, like accounting for me is a miracle. You know, it's like I would, I happily pay good money to an accountant to do my taxes every year because Absolutely. it saves me time, saves me money, makes me money. I mean, great. That's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. But when it comes to me, you know, I'll have a hundred people say, Oh man, your LinkedIn game is great. Maybe a little, maybe a little too consistent sometimes, which is like also a compliment backhanded compliment, because that's to your point of consistency. Um, yeah. But you know, it's like, I, I'm blind to my own strengths sometimes so trying to be aware of that. I think we all have that tendency unless we're like very self-absorbed and almost borderline narcissistic to say like, I see the goodness in everybody else, but I have a really hard time. Like I pick my stuff apart really critically and trying to always go back to that mindset. I, when I put my therapist hat on of like, okay, if I was talking to a friend or a colleague or a stranger about this, how would I talk to them versus how am I talking to myself? And why can't the same be true for myself? If I'm saying like, Oh, you're doing a really good job. Like for myself, I'm like, am I proud of the accomplishments I've created? And the answer is typically no. So I'm definitely working harder on like becoming more comfortable with embracing our successes and our areas of genius too. Yeah. And your tagline, doubt yourself and do it anyway, you know, or that idea of, um, there's some, there's some doubt there. That's okay. You know, there's some imposter syndrome vibes. That's okay. Continue yep. to do the work and ship it. And, and that's net positive in the end compared to being overwhelmed or overcome by those ideas. Um, totally. Yeah. You, you mentioned the word neurodivergent and that's, uh, we do attract a lot of clinicians in my network, but also a lot of marketers, um, for maybe the marketing side, you know, something with this conference, a, a pillar of this conference is help marketers learn the language of mental health. Could you unpack that word before we go into kind of how to make goals that, that yeah. come to fruition? And then with maybe your insight on neurodivergent, uh, tendencies through goal setting, but could we start there? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we're kind of in the neurodivergent movement right now, more so than I think we've ever been in society. And if we unpack the definition with starting with neurodiversity, 
the neurodiversity concept is just that all brains have some diversity. All neurotypes have some diversity. So we all, all of our brains have developed a bit differently. A neurotypical brain is more like this person has met the standards for um, what we would consider typical in terms of developmental milestones throughout life, whether it be socializing, communication, um, all of the things that come along with, with these developmental mi milestones that have been put in place. A neurodivergent brain is a brain that diverges or goes down a different pathway in terms of development from a neurotypical brain. This can encompass a lot of different things, but the main areas I think that we're talking about when we talk about neurodivergence are autism, ADHD, dyslexia, epilepsy. There are more under the umbrella, but just to stay um, within that realm, because that's really the, the main focal point. And I would say even more so that the main focal point is autism, ADHD. That's the big conversation happening in 2023 and beyond, most likely. Um, I myself got diagnosed both as autistic and ADHD. ADHD was about five years ago. It was not that surprising to me. I think there's a lot of like, when we think of ADHDers, we're like, oh, I mean, young white boys who are disruptive and unruly and chaotic and impulsive. And that's some of it, but there's a lot more to it. And that was not shocking to me. Um, the autistic piece was a bit more of a I don't know what the word is, not a gut punch, but it was, it was just a different emotion. And I think it was because of my own internalized ableism about what does autism mean? What mm -hmm. does autism look like? My immediate reaction was I worked in group homes. I'm, I can, I can speak, I can process information. I own multiple businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is a very ableist viewpoint from uh, that perspective, having to really unpack that and also get much more familiar with what it's like to be autistic and then to embrace it in the autistic like acceptance movement that's happening right now. Um, and it feels cool to be on the forefront, especially with that podcast, because it's life changing to be able to help normalize mm -hmm. experiences that so many people can't put words to, or just can't relate to in, in their own way. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's surely helpful for the audience and me and, um, and that, that ableism mindset, you know, that you sort of had to come to terms with and, and realize is kind of that full, that full concept and, and then move forward down the path of, you know, acceptance of, of where you're at, who you are and, um, kind of living in that fully, um, when it comes to when it comes to goal setting and maybe what I'll encourage us to do, because as much as I would love to talk with you for 60 minutes, maybe what I can encourage us to do is, is hyper-focus on, on the thing that you see, uh, works for you when it comes to, when you go and sit down to set goals, how do you do that? And w what is the thing that you see brings you to um, that future state of success, whether it's selling out a retreat or launching a new course or something in your personal life, you know, improving your relationships or saving money or something. Um, what's, what's your process coming from, you know, neurodiversity and, and, and also, um, from the perspective that you see your clients probably walk through because you're helping them do big things in their businesses and their practices. And, um, maybe, maybe just to recap one, one thing you do that works. And then one big mistake you see maybe people make as you coach them along the way. Okay. Big question. It is. One thing that everybody always wants, like the secret sauce. I think they're like, DM me, how do you do all the things? And I'm like, I, if I could, if I could bottle it, if I could sell it, my life would be a hell of a lot easier. Um, yeah, because I, I, we were talking earlier, like before the call, and this is a, a couple, but I just think highly of you, but I was like, this is like asking Jordan, like, how do you exactly shoot a jump shot? Like, tell me each, like, wh where's your wrist angle? And he's like, I just, t I just shoot the ball and I've done right. it a million times and I'm really great at it. So it is hard question. I've never been compared to Michael Jordan. So that is an enormous compliment. <laughs> So I think for me, and it's, it's about learning like the way that your energy manifests for me, I've always been someone who has to make decisions based off gut instinct and emotion. So I have to really try hard to 
follow the things that light me up, that really get me excited. And I have to pay attention to those things. If they are creating this, this intense dopamine slash sensation seeking um, situation where I'm like, oh, this is a lot of stimulation. This feels really good because the, AD, the ADHD part wants that stimulation all the time. So you have to kind of follow that. Um, and once you kind of are in that zone of genius, you're creating and you're hyper-focused and like nothing else matters. And I've created entire retreats in a day hmm. and I've been like sitting on my couch from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. Um, and then all of a sudden, boom, here we go. But it was not something that I had thought about or planned before that. So it's hard to say like, how do we do this structurally? But for those of you who are listening who are neurodivergent, I think it is so important to pay attention to that energy source because it's an ebb and flow. You're not always going to have it. Now, the flip side to your question, the dangers of this are hyper-focus means the world fades away sometimes. Someone's talking to you and you're just like in the zone and you're just not able to, to have that conversation. My wife knows, like if she sees a certain look on my face and I'm just like nodding at her, she's like, okay, we'll, we'll talk later. Um, because you can't just break out of it. It's not just as simple as like snapping your fingers. So uh, there, there can be some negative to that. Um, another thing that I see so often with my coaching clients or people in general in my circles are like trying to do too much. Like I have so many ideas all the time, but it would be impossible to do, to do them all today and to do them all well at one time. So when those like, when I'm getting flooded with 10 different ideas opposed to two, I really have to put that into like a Google doc or something that's just a brain dump and then revisit it a couple of days later and pay attention to that energy. If you revisit those ideas and it's no longer giving you the same spark, well, maybe it's getting crossed off the list or maybe it's just getting tabled for down the road. So I just launched a, um, an online summit. We had 32 speakers ended up getting about 5,000 people registered for it. It took a lot of energy, but it was something that I had wanted to do for the last three years, but it kept getting tabled and tabled because in the moment, it wasn't as exciting to me. I also knew it was going to be a tremendous amount of work and I just didn't have time for it. So there are, there's nothing wrong with setting goals, whether it be for the month, for the year, et cetera. We need some accountability measures in place to say, hey, I'm on track to do the things that I want to do. But more importantly, there is nothing wrong with pivoting from those goals. And there is nothing wrong with saying, this is not the thing that sparks me anymore. And then mm -hmm. just kind of getting rid of it. What I see far too often is people will not relinquish it because it's like, but I've already invested time, energy, resource. And then they almost feel embarrassed to say, I don't really want to do this anymore. And then unfortunately, what also happens is the old narrative of like, oh, well, it's because I'm ADHD, I'm just lazy, or I can't follow through, or I can't accomplish the thing I set out to do. And it's like, ADHD is so much more about like stimulation seeking and sensory seeking. So if it's not giving you that stimulation that your brain needs and is craving, it's okay to walk away from it. And I think that's a lesson I've really had to learn because the more you pursue the things that you're not really that inspired by, the less likely it is that it's going to be fulfilling and the less likely and the more likely it is that it's going to be emotionally um, exhausting in a way that you just don't want it to be. Man, that's so amazing that you are uh, so aware to follow your own, your own structure, your own design for how you operate and to use that uh, kick of dopamine uh, or, you know, just you know, who you are and build things around you that help you use that as a power in your life. And so that you're working from your core. This is an idea I'm thinking a lot about um, is how to work from our center and our core outward and radiate with power rather than force, which I would consider as like an external leveraged pressing that you can do. I can do that for a while. Like when I was in sales jobs, I got kind of good at it, but it was all sheer willpower and force and exhausted at the end of the day or the week emotionally because of how I was overextending myself. And so Take rather, a on your body. 
takes a major toll on your system when you're just forcing yourself through day in and day out. Yeah. So to somatically just listen and be, uh, you know, be able to reward yourself with, uh, with the good feels and the dopamine as a signal. Um, I've somatically gotten used to, uh, the, the chills in my neck when, when I'm in a conversation like this and something great happens or we're on to some idea, it's my body now that is saying, Ooh, hold, hold on to that. Note that, you know, I wrote a couple things down, um, in this conversation it, based on that, just it, what interests me. And I don't need to have the guilt or the shame that I don't deserve that kind of reward or I, you know, I don't, that, that doesn't belong in the place of career building or what have you. It's probably what I've like been ignoring, you know, most of these uh, years and now listening to it more closely is, is really helpful. For sure. No, it's super important. And like, I think as entrepreneurs, we often get in, infatuated or inundated with like the shiny object syndrome or comparison traps. And so often we're trying to like do things because we think we should be doing them instead of mm. because we want to be doing them. And I think that's a big differentiation that we all have to learn. And it shows up in the way you market your services. It shows up in the way that you talk about the things that you do when it feels much more aligned and much more in relation to your energy, it's going to come out in a completely different way. Instead of being like, I created this course. I spent a lot of time on it. I don't really care about it. Like you're not going to push it then you're not going to market it. And then if it flops, you're like, see, I can't do anything right. Mm -hmm. Like and nothing goes well for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Com compared to when you're working from a state of flow, like when I'm, I love to edit videos. I love to have calls like this. Um, but I've realized this is my, this will be like the 24th or 25th episode of the, of this podcast. And that's good. I think most fail after seven or 10. So I, yep. uh, my ego got a little boost after we made it into the, the <laughs> teens. Um, but then I realized I don't actually love the post-production part of this. So what you were talking about is like, Hey, it's okay to like walk away from a project. What I set in my goals this year is I'm going to outsource the post-production and somebody else can do the SEO keyword, uh, digging or use AI. I don't care. And just do the, do the back end of it because I, I want to keep having these conversations. Um, I just realized, oh, I don't want to do that part. And so, you know, it's either walk away from it entirely, which I've thought about, but then I'm going to, I'm going to try to just skim off the pieces that don't bring me joy, uh, just from being in it. Now I know like, oh, I love the convo and then hand it off to somebody who's even better than me. Um, cause it's not the video work that I thought I would like, which is creating some sizzle reel or something. It's like right. long form editing. For sure. And I think that's so spot on. And then you can circle back in another year and say, okay, I've, I've outsourced it. Is this still working for me? And if it's not, you can wipe your hands of it and say, I gave it my best try and I can move on. Or it could, create exponential growth and it allows you to kind of continue to focus on the things that you really enjoy. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're all seeking is like, what are the things we enjoy? How can we do more of them? How can we put more of that in our lives? Because time is so short. I think time is our most precious resource, regardless if you're a human or if you are an entrepreneur, it's the one we don't get back. So I'd rather spend my time doing things that I'm passionate about opposed to the things that I'm feel like are like, the have tos or the shoulds or the things that feel really laborious. Like that doesn't excite me at all. Yeah. I, uh, I, I read a book the other day that had this story in it of, I'll just tell it. It's this uh, young Yogi who uh, he's sitting under his old guru and he, he decides to leave his guru because he wants to learn how to walk on water. And so he wanders off and uh, years later, the guru, uh, comes across the student and the student is walking across the middle of a lake. Like he's learned the miracle. And the guru says, uh, that's amazing. How long did it take you to learn that? And the yogi says 27 years. And the guru says, you idiot, you could have just taken the ferry, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I don't, what I don't want in 30 years is to look back at this quote unquote miracle that I think was just for me just for like, this is the thing I did. Look at me. 
uh, I want it to be like, this is so additive to the world and net positive and not just for the individual, certainly it benefits me, but also it benefits the community in ways. Um, and then creating things that are, you know, like not reinventing the wheel, but definitely creating something new is interesting to me. Like, and that's hard to do, but, um, yeah, that's kind of where my mind goes with that story. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it's, it was interesting to me. I like that metaphor though. I mean, I like that example because it's true. I mean, we can spend so much time and energy trying to f freaking um, reinvent the wheel or do things differently. And in reality, there are so many support systems and structures out there where it's like, could have made my life a lot easier. And I didn't have to go through all this trial and tribulation to get to this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Well, Patrick, it's always great to talk with you. Um, thank you for talking about sort of goal setting with neurodiversity and, and maybe a misstep from your, your clients or your own perspective when you can drill in maybe too far and, and how to kind of get your headspace out of that through, uh, you know, alarms or what have you, you know, different things that we were talking about ahead of time. Um, but I love your awareness about who you are and it's like a classic example of know thyself, you know, work inside out. Um, so as we close, like, what do you want people to know who are listening about um, where to find you, you know, how to follow you and maybe, um, you know, anything else that you're working on that you want to make sure they hear. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on and um, looking forward to seeing you at your conference next October, September, yeah, October. Those days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where can people find me? You can listen to both podcasts on any, any place you listen to podcasts. So all things private practice is one and then divergent conversations is another. Um, we have weekly episodes in both and I think they're both really good in different ways. And then you can follow me on all the socials at all things private practice. If you want to come on a retreat, if you want to learn more about what I've got going on, you can go to my website, all things practice.com. All of those things are listed. Um, retreats in 2024 are Asheville, Ireland, Spain, Greece, and then a massive summit in Italy, all of which are sold out, but there is a wait list and that's always an option too. So I think Did you say it. Norway too. Norway is sold out. So I'm actually speaking at a retreat in Norway. Okay. I guess. Yeah. Okay. It's a friend who is hosting a retreat on neurodivergence and was like, will you come speak at my first retreat? And I was like, Oh, Northern lights, Norway. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. I'm in. So yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's in the works too. That's uh, fun. Norway is great. I toured kind of the perimeter of Norway, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. You'll love it. I think it's a beautiful country. It's I've never f taken so many great photographs just by dumb Watch. luck. You just point yeah. it at the fish market or point it sure. at the glacier. We're going to be in Tremoso, I think. Okay. Um, but yeah, it looks cool. Like it's, it's going to be a cool event and travel helps us step out of our comfort zones and, and grow because it's uncomfortable and you get to experience everything new. And I think that is the most beautiful way to experience life. Yeah. That's a hit of dopamine for me, for sure. Um, for sure. well, have a great rest of the year and a uh, great 2024. Thanks for being on. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and I hope we talk again soon. Sounds good, Steve. Thank you. All right.